lost and found. There seem to be different understandings in this text over exactly who is lost and who is found, aren't there? So much depends on the inflection of your voice. The text tells us that the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow, he welcomes sinners and he eats with them. But if you change the tone of your voice, it's a celebration. This fellow welcomes sinners and he eats with them. What is good news for some is decidedly not good news for others. This dinner scenario typifies just what is so difficult about living together in community because some days we can't tell who is lost and who is found. And every time we seem to get a handle on who is lost, Jesus goes and invites them to dinner. So Jesus hears the grumbling. He's talking with the sinners who were a category of people who were not following the law, the religious law, obeying religious rules. And he's also talking with tax collectors. These people were more than just religious rule breakers. They were political problems because they were Hebrew people who were collecting taxes from other Hebrew people for the Roman authorities. They were employees of an occupying power they were the Vichy French. The sinners and the tax collectors faced shame and exclusion from their society, and Jesus eats dinner with them. You can see why there was grumbling. So Jesus tells a story. Which of you, he asks, if you lose a sheep, wouldn't leave the rest of your flock to go find the one that is lost? Or if you had 10 coins, wouldn't you turn your house upside down to find one that was missing? He tells this story to the Pharisees and to the scribes and to us. And we're once again wondering what Jesus means with his cryptic stories. One thing I'm sure about in this story is that we are never the finders. The finding of lost sheep and lost coins is not our job. Certainly we are to be welcoming and to share the good news that we've received, but that is not the same as going out to save someone. That is God's role in these stories. I hope that will free us from the responsibility of saving people. We are not the finders, we are the found. There is no indication also in this story that the lost objects were worthy of saving. It doesn't say it was a good sheep, a repentant sheep, a born again sheep. It was a lost sheep. The found in this story are also not helpful in their finding. The lost coin does not shout out, here I am, here I am, I'm under the shiffer robe, look for me. I've heard conflicting reports about the intelligence of sheep, but I am confident that we can all agree that a lost sheep would not put his own picture on a milk carton to help rescuers in his search. In this story, God is cast as the shepherd and the woman. We are a barnyard animal and a lost inanimate coin. That may not be very flattering to our egos to be compared to sheep and dirty money, but it is good news. We once were lost, but now we're found. What news could be better? Somehow we act as if it often isn't good news. In those moments when we feel we're already one of the found sheep or one of the no longer lost coins, we don't always celebrate and rejoice over the finding of our lost siblings, do we? Why is that? Even when we're happily gamboling about in the fields without a care in the world, safe in the fold of God's care and mercy, why do we get upset when the shepherd's attention is focused on somebody else? Why, when we're safe in our owner's wallet, do we get upset when she goes after that missing coin? I have no idea, but I do know I'm as guilty of it as the next scribe or Pharisee. Jesus ends his parable with this sentence, just so I tell you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. When we are found, when our siblings are found, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. So how does God's own joy translate into how we live our lives with joy? How does it translate on who we invite to dinner? Where are the sinners and the tax collectors in your life? Where are the scribes and the Pharisees, for that matter? Who are the people our society wants to remain lost coins? Some states' legislators are actively making life difficult for people who are transgender, barring them from access to health care, name changes, other public safety that many of us take for granted. There are churches who join in that exclusion. 
We're also at the end of Black History Month, and there are leaders in our country who want to keep the stories of black Americans from being taught, on top of the many, many other ways racism harms black bodies in our culture. Of course, it's easier for me to find ways that other people want to exclude. It's much harder to see it in myself. But I confess for me, I turn into a scribe and Pharisee at the idea of Jesus having dinner with Pat Robertson, the Westboro Baptist folks, or a bunch of white supremacists. There would be much grumbling from this Pharisee if I were to see that dinner party. But I have to allow for it because I once was lost too. Some of you have heard me tell this story before, but when I was in college, to make a very long story short, I got pregnant my sophomore year. Now today, that doesn't really feel so much like I was lost. But 30 plus years ago, I felt terribly lost and unworthy of being a part of God's flock. Shame is a powerful tool that can separate us from each other at the time we need it the most. And a Presbyterian congregation was a big part of my being found. They loaned me maternity clothes. They visited me in the hospital. They took me out to lunch after worship to make sure I was eating enough. They helped me hear the shepherd's voice and to walk away from shame and find my way back to the flock. In this parable, the congregation were the sheep in the flock who went to the shepherd and nudged him over in my direction, making sure he and I were close enough for him to hear my cries. That's, or they were the other coins who jumped out of the woman's hand and landed near where I was lost so that I would be found. That's the lesser known verse of the parable. It doesn't really translate out of the Greek. I was supposed to be joining that church when I figured out I was pregnant, and I went to my pastor and I told him it was not the right time for me to join the church after all. He asked me why, I told him about the pregnancy, and he said, when could you possibly need a church family more than you do right this very minute? And so I was welcomed home. I was found. I will forever be thankful that that congregation rejoiced with the angels over the sheep who found their way through a thicket of a year. 34 years later, it still gets me. I placed my son for adoption and he will be 34 in June. I've been a part of his life the whole way through, in large part because of that congregation. This is a story of rejoicing, despite the fact that I'm crying. <laughs> if God can call me daughter, if Jesus searched far and wide to bring me into the fold, then I have to leave room for people who I think are doing it all wrong so that they can be found as well. If God's economy has room for me, I have to do everything I can to support the other people God has searched for and found and brought home. Jesus interrupts our complaining about those other lost sheep and coins to remind us of our own foundness to remind us to celebrate more, to remind us that nobody is lost beyond hope of return. Nobody. You're already my beloved child. If I made room for you in the flock, in my coin purse, don't you think there is also room for the other children of mine? This is a celebration. The reminder in this text is that God's, in God's economy, there is more than enough grace to go around, and we do not have to serve as bouncers at the gate determining who gets into the flock. We are called just to rejoice that we're included too. There's a story I saw on the internet, so it must be true. <laughs> it goes, there was a farmer who grew excellent quality corn, and every year he won the award for the best grown corn. One year a newspaper interviewer, reporter interviewed him and learned something interesting about how he grew his crop. The reporter discovered that the farmer shared his seed corn with his other neighbors. How can you afford to share your best seed corn with your neighbors when they are entering corn in competition with yours every year, the reporter asked. Don't you know, said the farmer, the wind picks up pollen from ripening corn and swirls it from field to field. If my neighbors grow inferior corn, cross-pollination will steadily degrade the quality of my corn. If I grow, am to grow good corn, I must help my neighbors grow good corn as well. So it is with our lives. 
Those who want to live meaningfully and well must help enrich the lives of others, for the value of life is measured by the lives it touches. And those who choose to be happy must help others find happiness, for the welfare of each is bound up with the welfare of all. See, sometimes the internet is useful. <laughs> Friends, this is the heart of God's economy. The welfare of each is bound up in the welfare of all. We can celebrate the seeking of the lost coins and the lost sheep because we too once were lost and now are found. All week I've been thinking about the statement from the complainers at the beginning of the text. This fellow welcomes sinners and he eats with them. How can we live our lives so that we can take this phrase and turn it from a complaint to a celebration? Maybe all of our church signs should read, this congregation welcomes sinners and eats with them. Maybe we should make t-shirts. But I think we need to make some clear that we know we are among the sinners in question. Maybe it should say, Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with us. And there's room for you too. Friends, we who once were lost have now been found. And there is joy in the presence of the angels of God because of that truth. So let us live our lives in gratitude because of that great news. Amen.